Hello and welcome to the business podcast at Imperial College London. I am your host, Amin Siala, and today I've got a very exciting guest. Today I've got with me Professor Jonathan Haskell. Jonathan Haskell is a professor of economics at Imperial College Business School, Imperial College London, and director of the doctoral program at the school. He has been a visiting professor at the Tuck School of Business, Dartmouth College, Stern School of Business, New York University, and the Australian National University. And since February 2016, he has been a non-executive director of the UK Statistics Authority. And recently, he was the joint winner of the £125,000 2017 Indigo Prize for the best essay on whether GDP is a good measure of activity or not. So again, whether GDP was a good measure of activity or not. And his latest book, which will be the main theme of this episode today, is Capitalism Without Capital, published by Princeton University Press. Professor, thanks a lot for coming on the podcast. Thank you very much, Amin, for having me. Pleasure to be here. Absolutely. So when we first met, and that was when you, um, it, w- it was the first couple of weeks when I joined Imperial as a student at the business school, and um, we all heard about Capitalism Without Capital, and you, and, you, and you presented it in about 10 minutes. It, it fascinated me and it fascinated everyone who's listening. But the recent change or the most significant part that happened since then was the Indigo Prize. Now, for a starters, congratulations. Thank you. Um, what's the Indigo Prize before we go into the, the, the winning submission? In uh, Over the summer this year, a uh, hedge fund called Letter One mm. decided to issue a prize. And it said... We will uh, solicit submissions uh, for a 5,000 word essay on, as you said, I mean, whether GDP is a, is a good measure. Right. Essentially, the idea was that we have a new economy, we have digital activities such mm. as the one we're listening to now, we've got all sorts of free stuff available on the internet, we have entrepreneurship, we have all sorts of different activities, a very different portrayal of the economy. Uh, from the 1940s when GDP was first invented. And so the thinking behind uh, the prize was to solicit an essay from anybody, Mm -hmm. uh, 5,000 words, uh, as to whether GDP adequately measured all those various things. So I put a little team together Mm -hmm. and uh, we submitted our essay. And as as you were saying in your kind introduction, on the table was £125,000. So (laughs) anybody who's thinking about writing an essay and writing about their homework right now, um, have a look maybe next summer. It uh, (laughs) might come up as well. And then might be 125,000 quid on the table. Right. So uh, I wonder what the maths is if you divide the pounds by words, but to be... <laughs> uh, we work very hard on this essay, so I'm sure we were earning well below the minimum wage. I just want to reassure everybody about that. <laughs> okay, so this submission. Now, is it relevant to Capitalism Without Capital, which is the book that will be out now if you're listening to this podcast? Um, how relevant is it? Are you talking about intangible economy? Yeah, so the book... Uh, is really about a move to the intangible economy, which, you know, maybe we'll talk about later on. But there's a bit of background. One of the things about GDP Mm. is that it's an attempt to measure uh, the activity that's going on in the economy. And part of the activity that's going on in the economy uh, is how much firms are investing. Uh, Firms are always buying new buildings, new planes. Tesco are buying new trucks to ship all their stuff around and all that kind of thing. And Mm. we've got a pretty good idea because we've been measuring as a national uh, as a convention of national t- statistics we've been measuring all this these types of tangible investment really as i say since the 1940s when gdp was first in, in, invented mm-hmm. the way the economy has changed which is the subject of our book but mm-hmm. also relates to the prize is that the economy has become much more intangible so what firms are investing in nowadays yeah. is stuff you can't really touch or feel. It's things like branding. It's things like writing software. Right. It's things like analyzing databases. It's things like design. It's mm. things like the whole organizational process of the firm itself. Mm. Uh, Now, this is a challenge for GDP measurement Mm. because GDP measurement just finds it too difficult to measure all that sort of stuff. Mm. It's not quite true. Over the last kind of 30 years, there's been a move to incorporating more of that stuff in GDP. But basically, this is an area of investment which just isn't very well measured in GDP. And what we did in our prize submission is we tried to say, here are some new ways of measuring this type of investment. Uh, And then we expand on that kind of thing in the book. 
Right. And so you managed to squeeze all that in 5,000 words. Uh, We did. And including also some suggestions if you wanted to go beyond GDP for measuring things like the value of a a podcast, Mm. let us say, or the value of Wikipedia or or the value of a lot of free goods, which are now available on the Internet and search engines and things like that. And we did that by essentially proposing that you run online experiments. Maybe some of your listeners might have been involved in these experiments where you essentially say to a marketing company, how much would you be willing to pay for Mm. a search engine? How much would you be willing to pay to give up Facebook or something like that? Okay. So the with regards to the submission, uh, again, for the Indigo Prize, what was the main message, if you could summarize it? I mean, you've summarized it enough with 5,000 words. But, uh, so the main message was, if you want to stick to GDP and yep. stick to the general framework of GDP, which is essentially measuring the prices and the quantities of these outputs, here are a few things, here are a few ways you could fix GDP. You could mm. better measure the intangibles and better measure some prices. If you wanted to throw away GDP altogether, you could do some different things. Uh, and like, For example asking people how much they're willing to pay for some of these free goods and all of that. So th- those were the two bits in the uh, right. in the essay. So when GDP was invented, as you say, in the 40s, essentially it was invented for a time different to today. Uh, absolutely. And if you think about the 1940s, the electricity revolution was playing itself out. Mm. Lots of companies had redone the way they produced things. If you think about, I don't know, car companies of the time, yep. the car industry, which around the turn of the uh, 20th century was incredibly unsettled. Uh, it, there were people producing cars on pe- running on petrol. There were people producing cars running on steam. Yep. There were people producing cars running on electricity. No mass production had yet been invented. It was all very customized. Really, by the 1940s, that kind of mass production, mass industrialization had sort of settled down. And the people who wanted to measure all this stuff, both in the national accounts to measure GDP, but mm-hmm. also the company accounts as well. They've got to measure all this stuff and figure yeah. out what the companies are doing. Uh, yeah. They developed a pretty sophisticated you know, series of accounts, which essentially says, OK, uh, company, I get, I say, take a large company like uh, Ford, for example. It's got a whole load of buildings. Mm. It's got a whole load of plants. It's got a whole load of machinery. It's got a whole load of vehicles to move all these vehicles around. Let's measure those very tangible things. And so that's okay. what it did. And that was how the system of accounting really evolved. In the, in the 1940s. But, but you say it has been changing, though. To be fair, so it's been change, past, changing a little bit. And if we think about the development of the uh, economy over that time, it just since then, it just became much more intensive, as I was saying, um, intangible types of goods. So okay. what did firms start doing? They started doing much more R&D. Mm. Uh, so I don't know, the inventors, for example, of the CAT scanner, if you've ever been to hospital mm. uh, and, and had a CAT scan. Luckily not yet. Luckily not yet. <laughs> Thanks. The CAT, well, many sports people do. For, oh, okay. you know, for, for, for example, so if there are any okay. uh, you know sports people out there who've had a sort of complicated injury, right, okay. many of your you, you know you know you you might have gone to hospital and, and done all of that. Right. Um, that was all invented in the 1970s, mm. um, but by a company called EMI. Uh, and the thing that EMI did bizarrely is that they had the music rights to the Beatles. So, so all, the same company that what invented the CAT scan is the same company that owns the rights to the Beatles. Correct. So they were one of these very large, now rather old-fashioned conglomerate companies Mm. doing a whole load of activities. The Beatles became unbelievably popular, making vast amounts of money. They didn't know what to do with it. So they gave it to this uh, interesting inventor called uh, Godfrey uh, Hounsfield. And uh, what he did is he had this idea that if you took an X-ray of an object from lots of different angles yeah. and then built the picture up, you could get a kind of a 3D uh, uh, pic- entire picture of the object. Wow. Uh, and that's what, he dis- that's what he did. And they invented the CAT scanner. So there's an example there where a little bit of R&D essentially uh, wow. started to be put in place. And uh, increasingly what firms are doing is they're getting much more focused on the more R&D type of intangible functions rather than the more tangible functions like I was saying earlier on. And how can you measure the success of R&D? Is it just by the products that are produced on a yearly basis or...? So that's a, obviously a very difficult thing to do, very and that's difficult. why yeah. accountants are very reluctant to sort of do all of that. So essentially there are two ways in there. What, one way is to say, well, of course, since all of these uh, successful products were actually produced, yep. we could go around and count how many products and uh, what the value of the products was. And when EMI first started producing CAT scans, uh, they were extremely successful. 
they then fell upon much harder times uh, for a set of intangible reasons that we can talk about. Um, okay. But but essentially, uh, on your question about how you can measure it, uh, once you produce all of these goods, then you can try to measure the R and D uh, that, as it were, is embodied in them. So, uh, in, in in a sense, and I think this question is almost two part. What I'm saying is that this uh, the one question would be how can uh, from an economic perspective. Uh, how can the economy measure R and D? I'm um, sort of in the bigger picture. Right. But for an individual company, how can it measure uh, R and D? So, for example, if it's spending 10 percent of its budget on R and D, how can it assess whether that's worthwhile or not? Is there a way? So that would be a very good place to start, which is to measure how much they're doing on R and D. Mm. And of course, the other thing that the companies want to do, and and this is where poor old EMI fell down, is there are a set of other intangible activities around R and D. For example, marketing and branding. Uh, for example, forming supply chains, forming good relationships with your customers. There are a whole set of other types of expenditures, yeah. a package of which is going to turn out to be really important for making these intangible assets into a success. Okay. And measuring the spending and the time allocated on those uh, is another thing that companies need to do. Right. So before getting into more economics, I'm interested in uh, your time at the UK Statistics Authority. And so you've been there since February 2016, so well over a year now. Tell us about that. So the UK Statistics Authority is the body which is responsible for regulating the production of government statistics. Mm. And government statistics could be absolutely anything. So, for example, they could be the number of students going to college and their ethnic uh, backgrounds. Uh, backgrounds and all that kind of stuff. So there's a whole lot of statistics on that, whether they're paying back their loans or whether they're not paying back their loans, there's a whole lot of statistics on that, right the way through to crime statistics, mm. to hospital statistics, and then right the way through to things like GDP itself, namely the output of the whole economy, inflation, unemployment, and all of that. So, I mean, it's an enormous, enormous sort of treasure trove of statistics, which the office is responsible for producing. And what the Statistics Authority does is it's the board who essentially governs the workings of the office and make sure they're doing the right thing and tries to push them in the right direction. Okay, so generally speaking, how important is it that countries have these statistics authorities that actually stay on top of measuring everything? Well, I think it's very important for countries to have statistics. So the chairman of our authority, Sir David Norgrove, his view is statistics are like clean water. Okay. You just Modern societies just can't do without them because mm. if you're going to make decisions and if you can understand the world around you, you need good statistics. So that's point number one. Point number two is how are you going to make sure that those statistics are reliably produced? Mm. Yeah. And the, question. the benefit of having an independent body who will oversee the production of statistics, which is what the UK Statistics Authority is, is that hopefully they will avoid the uh, notion of politicians trying to you know, push statisticians around. Mm. And if they're unhappy with what statisticians are doing, uh, these politicians might try to influence them and all of that. So a very good example of that is Argentina, actually. Okay. So the Argentinian Statistical Authority, which I, I, I know is not a subject which everybody often studies, <laughs> but during okay. a period of very significant inflation in Argentina, the, the statisticians who were producing inflation were leaned on very, very heavily by the mm. government. And essentially what happened is some of those statisticians broke away, produced their own figures, which were much more disadvantageous. They showed essentially much higher inflation. Uh, and and uh, some of them were pr even prosecuted um, by the government. So again, the importance of having an, an independent source of statistics, I think, is very, uh, very helpful. So how can you ensure that it, there is a level of independence on the authorities that actually find these statistics? So we are an independent board. It's true that the Office of National Statistics is funded by the Treasury, so uh, the, they, there is a non-independent link there. But we're an independent board. If we think there's some problem with the statistics, we call it out. If we think politicians are not using statistics very well, uh, as we did a couple of weeks ago when the Foreign Secretary announced £350 million pounds uh, uh, when we leave the EU, which mm. we think is a misleading statistic, uh, right. we, we call the Foreign Secretary out and so forth. Um, and so uh. we try to be independent. And of course, we're answerable to Parliament, to a select committee uh, in Parliament as well ourselves. So there's somebody overlooking us too. What I was actually going to ask you about when you mentioned the uh, statistics in general was to see if you can give us a, a converse example of a country that, that completely neglects its focus on statistics and what a, con what a country like that looks like. And then just to compare it with a country that does focus on producing statistics, verifying them, making sure they're reliable. Maybe a good example is Greece. Yeah. 
in advance of joining the euro, any economy that wants to join the euro mm. has to demonstrate that it's basically economically sound. And one of the economic mm. sound, one of the measures of economic soundness, is the amount of debt that the government is running. Uh, and the uh, Greek statistical authorities were, it seems, uh, leaned on by the government to produce a favourable set of debt statistics mm. in order to help. Uh, the uh, uh, in order to help the Greek economy um, meet the criteria for joining the euro, so yeah. it does seem like a case where um, the independence of statistics led to a series of probably really rather bad decisions. Since poor old Greece has not fared too well no. uh, <laughs> not, uh, under not the burden of the euro, to say the least. So let's uh, let's get on with capitalism with that capital. So how long have you been working on this? How long have you been working on the idea to begin with? And then when did you decide that, oh, actually, I think, I think we can make a book out of this? So behind this book is about 10 years of research. And the 10 years of research goes back to what I was saying earlier on. We think the economy has changed from an economy where firms were making these tangible investments to where they're making much more intangible investments, as we were saying earlier on. Accountants and statisticians find it very difficult to measure these types of intangible investments. Okay. But we took the view when we started this program work about 10 years ago, although this was difficult, we thought we'd have a go. I mean, okay. this is Imperial College, right? Yep. There are all sorts of difficult challenges out there. Right. And Imperial, you know, likes to think that it can have a go at difficult things. Okay. So we had a go at that. And so what we did essentially is we produced a set of experimental accounts, which is to say, suppose you went out and tried to measure as best you could all these intangible investments that firms are making, as I was saying, the design that they're doing, the branding that they're doing, the training that they're giving of those workers. Suppose you went out and tried to measure all that stuff. What would the society, GDP, the national accounts, company accounts, what would they look like mm. if you tried to do all of this? So we produced a series of kind of experimental accounts uh, and we thought the economy looked rather different once you did all of this. Mm. Uh, we How thought, different? Uh, and we also thought uh, that the economy would um, have a led a different properties. Okay. And that le led us to thinking that uh, maybe we should write a book uh, to try to tell everybody about all of this. Right, okay. Speaking of the book, uh, it was I really enjoyed reading it. Um, and what I think is great about it is that it's full of anecdotes, full of stories. So every statement that's made there is backed up by a story, by an example, just rich of examples, one after the other from different times, different industries. And it, so it's it's vastly different from, say, let's say traditional dull economics book. You know, this really is trying to prove the point that, you know, the intangibles are something that you are very well aware of as in to, to any reader out there. So I, I guess it's worth it. Now, there's so many pages here and there's so many different chapters, but um, I, I think you've, you've split it into three sections, which I think will be able to summarise the book. So just briefly, the three sections are the following. So the first one is the rise of the intangible economy. That's just, I guess, comparing how the economy used to be more tangible and then how intangibles are creeping up slowly. And there's Correct. data to prove that. Correct. Secondly, the economic properties of intangibles. So what do those intangibles look like? Right. And okay. And then number three is the consequences of the rise in the intangible economy. And that is a very interesting one, um, which uh, we have a lot of questions for you about. I, uh, I actually uh, posted uh, about this podcast uh, a couple of days ago, and uh, a lot of my colleagues left me many, many questions. And the majority of the questions actually ask about the rise of the intangible economy. It seems like there isn't much dispute slash debate on whether intangible are rising, because quite frankly, you've shown the data on the book. It's, it's inevitable. It's unquestionable. Well, well, again, we, we hope we've tried to establish that and, that, and that's the product of quite a lot of work. Yeah. I mean, essentially, what, what, what the situation is the following, that for every pound or euro or dollar mm -hmm. of tangible investment, there's about one pound ten or one euro ten or one dollar ten mm. nowadays of intangible investment. So again, for every dollar of buildings, vehicles, plant machinery, those traditional, very tangible things, there's more than a dollar's worth, more than a, a, a dollar's worth of the intangible things, the software, the design, right. the R&D. 10% extra. Correct. And, and that's a think... measure of how much we think the economy has changed. Right. And do you think that will keep growing? So will it be 20% maybe in, in 50 years time? Or Yeah. So one of the things that we document in the book is the long-term trend. And it's just a very steady long-term trend towards these uh, intangible investments. That That's the way the economy is going. Uh, but the other thing that we document, which we think is kind of interesting, is yeah. to ask the question is, what's happened since the Great Recession? So at least for economists, mm. we're incredibly interested in what happened since the financial 
financial crisis in 2007, 2008, where mm. many developed economies went into the most massive tailspin. Mm. And what you see is, I think interestingly, a complete collapse of tangible investments. So lots of people are aware of that. Firms are investing much less in buildings and vehicles and all that sort of stuff. Mm. There was somewhat of a collapse of intangible investment, but then intangible investment recovered quite substantially. So it's not growing quite as fast as it was, uh, but it nonetheless is outstripping tangible investment in the way that I described. Okay, and there was a section in your book where you compared uh, countries in the OECD and you compared the percentage of investment of intangibles and then you compared them to less developed countries and then you just saw a direct relationship. Yes, so one of the features of developed economies mm. is they are much more focused on intangible investment than lesser developed economies as well. Sorry, now do you think that's deliberate? Or is it just the nature of how things have evolved? Uh, no, I think it is a deliberate choice of those economies. Okay. So the comparative advantage, the sort of competitive strength of the more developed economies is going to be around the intangible assets that they can deploy okay. uh, because they're going to be able to make a success of pooling all these intangible assets together in the ways that in intangible asset assets kind of fit together. Okay. Now, before we launch into the book then, let's, let's get, give the listeners a brief summary of the intangible economy. What is it? What's the change? What's tangible versus intangible? Maybe just basic definitions of those. Well, um, maybe it's probably a good reason to start with what the definition of capital is. Okay. Uh, our book is called Capitalism Without Capital. Great title. There are, thank you very much. There are lots and lots of books with the word capital in them. Right. Uh, Karl Marx, of course, had a book with the word capital in them. <laughs> okay. uh, and Thomas Piketty, uh, for the economics listeners, would know uh, yeah. he had a very uh, well-known book called Cap Capital in the 21st Century. Yep. Uh, so it's probably worth just starting with what what the definition of capital is. Great. Uh, capital is something which comes from investment mm. and a capital and it produces a capital asset. Okay. A capital asset is something that a company involves which is going to give it a long some kind of long lasting benefit. Mm. So I don't know, if we think about Sainsbury's for example, mm. Sainsbury's capital assets. Well, when you walk into Sainsbury's supermarket, its building is obviously a capital asset. There's a long term uh, part of Sainsbury's which they own. Yep. When you go and check out your goods, uh, it's uh, all the machinery and the cash registers and all the equipment there. That's going to be one of their capital assets as well. Again, right. it's something which is in the long term. It's going to be there for the next few years mm. and provide a sort of flow of services. And then if you get your stuff delivered, uh, then, the, then the truck uh, that comes around and delivers all your stuff, that's yep. going to be a capital asset as well. Okay. So those are all the kind of tangible capital assets. Right. Stuff you can touch. Stuff you can touch and feel. Okay. But of course, Sainsbury's has got a boatload and increasingly more intangible capital assets. Mm. So every time you check out your goods, especially if you use your frequent you know, shopper card, mm -hmm. um, Sainsbury's are going to collect a load of data about you. Mm. So collecting that data about you is then going to be an intangible asset right. potentially of Sainsbury's because then, then they, they, they will then be able to figure out how best to market to you, what offers to send to you, where you live, and you know all, all that kind of thing. Okay. Uh, so those are the kind of ways, and those are the differences between the tangible and the Intangible. intangible. Okay. And that has been rising recently. That has been rising recently. Mm -hmm. And indeed, some companies consist almost exclusively of just the intangible side of things. So maybe Uber is quite a good example. Mm -hmm. uh, so the thing about Uber, as everybody knows, is mm. they don't own a single taxi cab. <laughs> in fact, more recently, they've ordered from Volvo, this was in the Financial Times yeah. last week, a series of self-driving cars. Okay. So you might say, well, don't they own the self-driving cars? Mm -hmm. Well, actually, they're not even going to own the self-driving cars. A third company is going to have the ownership, and then uh, uh, and then Uber is going to set up some kind of rental rental relationship from them, and they're getting it from Volvo. So why? why? Uh, see, it's interesting because I saw the headline last week, and I was actually going to mention this now. Yeah. Uh, I thought that would slightly change because Uber was always a great example that they don't own taxis. But then I thought, I think they ordered fifteen thousand, maybe twenty five thousand Volvos. And uh, but you're saying nonetheless they're actually not going to own them. Uh, correct, because they want to remain very intangible, intensive, or very tangible light. If you oh, see what I mean, okay. that's part of the vision of you know what lots of these companies want to Probably do. Probably part of the business model as well. Part of the business model. And again, okay. if you ask the question, just as we asked about Sainsbury's, what are Uber's intangible assets? Yeah, if you start to think about it, it's pretty obvious. They've got no tangible capital, but they've got incredible amounts of intangible capital. So the obvious thing is their software. Right, wow. The software that they have that everybody uses, which is 
you know, works so incredibly well. Um, that's an obvious intangible asset. Uh, just like Sainsbury's, obviously, they've got loads of data on the types of travel, you know, that, that you and I do. And of course, they've got lots of data on the travel of their taxi drivers. Mm. And so that's a very important asset for them as well. So Uber's other intangible asset, of course, is all the data that they have, not mm. only on you and me, mm. but also it's the data that they have about their taxi drivers. Yep. And that's very valuable to them because they can then go to the car companies and negotiate better insurance premia for their taxi drivers, mm. yeah. for the dr taxi drivers who are safer. Mm. So there's an example where, where they've got an intangible asset uh, and they use it. They've got a fantastic network. They've done all manner of political lobbying. They know their way around, yeah. you, you know, all the regulatory constraints and all that kind of thing. So again, oh. Uber is this sort of remarkable bundle of very intangible assets, right. not the kind of company who in the 1940s, when we first started thinking about measuring all this stuff, that just wasn't the kind of company that we could at all measure. Yeah, and this makes it scalable, which we will be going into later, but uh, they, uh, I completely understand. And I guess Airbnb is another example, right? So Airbnb is another terrific example where, again, if you went to, let, let me kind of be just a little bit boring about this, if you'll forgive me. No. If you went to their company accounts and said, well, tell me about the assets that Airbnb have. Okay. Uh, if you went to a conventional hotel, they'd be all the hotels and all the equipment and all that kind of thing. Airbnb, of course, don't have any of that at all. Right. So again, what do they have? They have a fantastic piece of software. They have the marketing. They have the reputation. They have the design. Uh, again, a very different type of company to the traditional tangible based uh, companies of yesteryear. Right. And with regards to the long term trend, now there was a point that you've identified when intangibles superseded tangibles investment in the US. Yeah, that, that in, in the US, the overtaking point seems to have been around the late 1990s or so, okay. Uh, okay. probably associated with the internet boom. But that's been a very long uh, term trend in the US. Okay. In Europe, the overtaking point was a little bit later, um, probably around the 2000s. Okay. Uh, but as I say, you know, we've now got to this point where there's more intangible investment going on uh, than there is tangible. So investment. would you consider this a tipping point? I think it is a tipping point because of the different properties of intangible investment. In other words, you might say, well, you might say, what's the you know, why should we bother with any of mm. this? You might say the nature of investment, the nature of capital assets in economy changes all the time. Yep. So in the old days, for example, we used to have a whole load of canals. Mm. That was a major piece of intangible investment. Then we got rid of the canals because we invented railways. Then we got rid of the railways and we had a lot of roads. Then we invented air travel and we had airports. In other words, you might say the nature of investment just changes all the time. Yep. So why on earth should we worry about this change to intangible investment? Why should it be regarded as being a tipping point? And that's really the second part of our book, which is to ask the question, what is it that is different about these intangible assets? Okay. What, what makes them different and therefore makes the economy potentially different? Okay, so you've summarized them into the four S's. But just before I hit the four S's, just to go back to the point I mentioned earlier about the, the tipping point, so to speak. Mm. Now, would you say it's possible to project um, or try to speculate as to which countries are worth betting on, if you like, with which countries are worth investing on, if you can see the trend or the speed which they're going to arrive to the tipping point, so to speak? Well, if you then look across the different European countries, yeah. which is the ones for whom we have the best data, and ask the question, who's doing more intangible investment and who's doing less? The answer basically is the Northern European countries are doing more and okay. the Southern European countries are doing less and the US is doing more as well. So in particular, Scandinavian countries, mm. and people will be familiar, of course, with Finland, Sweden and all of that. They are very intangible, intensive, disproportionately okay. large amounts of R&D, disproportionately large amounts of design, all that kind of thing. Italy, Spain, uh, Greece, Portugal, uh, the best way we can measure them are, are, are doing rather less intangible investment. Okay, now is there an example of a country which is intangible heavy, but maybe isn't sort of working in the way we'd expect it to? Or would you say it's quite clear cut and dry that really if you're intangible heavy then you must be doing something good? No, I think this, this, this is what's so difficult about all of this, mm. is, is the Nordic countries uh, very intangible, heavy, as you describe. Uh, I mean, and coming up to the Great Recession, to the financial crisis in 2007, they were the poster children of good economic performance. And mm. everybody said, wow, this is the way to go. We should be more like them. Actually, as it turned out, they suffered the most in the Great Recession. Their GDP and their productivity collapsed the most over that time. They've 
recovered a little bit since then. Right. But they're the ones who had it, who were hit much harder in the recession. And you link that to them being intangible heavy, so to speak. Correct. Uh, to do with the properties of the intangibles. That is very interesting. So the properties of intangibles, great cue. <laughs> so very briefly, you've got the scalable uh, sunk spillovers synergies. Why don't we start with scalable? What's scalability? So the scalability, let's go back to the taxi example. Yep. The scalability of this is if you run Bob's local taxis and okay. you've got a fleet of four or five taxis and you want to expand, you've got to buy some more taxis. Mm. There's just no, you can't carry any more passengers without buying more taxis and that's just, that's just the end of it. Right. On the other hand, if you run Uber and you want to go into another city, you've got the software. All you need to do is get people to download it. It's exactly the same software, pretty much, which you can use in the other cities. Okay. So the property of these intangible assets is you can scale up much more readily than you can with the tangible assets. Right. Now, with regards to the tangible, one of the examples that you allude to in the book many times, which is the gym. Yes. So how, how does that compare to Uber, for example? So we, we look at old-fashioned gyms and, 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 and uh, more modern gyms. And you might think, if you've ever been to the gym, yeah. what can the difference actually be or if you're thinking of going to the gym so <laughs> not yet listen to the end of this podcast and <laughs> then you can go new year's uh, resolution the new year's abs uh, absolutely and and by the way we're drinking coffee and donuts and all sorts of fattening <laughs> food so we're certainly going to have to head off to the gym not practicing what we preach from this exactly <laughs> uh, uh so if you might think that gyms might be exactly the same and you might think listen i know what the tangible assets in a gym are there's the equipment and the machines and you know the stuff the you know the weights that you pull up and down all that mm. kind of thing of course more modern day gyms, a lot of intangible assets have started to slip in as well. So anybody who's ever done any of the body pump exercises, for example, okay. uh, the way we think about that is as a bundle of intangible assets. So the music, for mm. example, is an intangible asset. Yep. There's nothing tangible about music, yep. yet the body pump people uh, have uh, put together a, a series of music. The training of the staff in order to conduct one of these uh, body pump sessions, you've got to be trained and you've got to submit yourself on a video uh, to, the, uh, uh, to the body pump co company. Yep. Um, so there's some training going on as well. Um, there's lots of software involved in all of this too, yep. uh, distributing all the music around and all that. So again, I think that these intangible assets are creeping in in various hidden ways. Mm even to what you think might think of as being very ta traditional, tangible business. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. So what's a sunk and what's a sunk cost? So a sunk cost, so this is a slightly specialist economics uh, okay. kind of notion here, but there's nothing wrong with that. Yeah. A sunk cost is a cost that you can't get back mm. once you've incurred it. So but people uh, will be familiar with Monarch Airlines, poor old Monarch, yep. Britain's fifth, I think, largest carrier. Down the drain. Uh, down, down the drain a, a, a couple of months ago. Uh, and if you ask the question, what do the Monarch Airlines business consist, consist of? Mm. It basically consisted of two things. The first thing is it consists of is a load of planes. Okay. And if you've been listening carefully up until now, you'll know that those planes are the tangible side of things. Right. Absolutely. <laughs> uh, so what did Monarch manage to do? All those planes were returned immediately to their leasing companies okay. and the creditors essentially got their money back. In fact, Many of the planes, most of their planes were returned within a fortnight. They were mm. returned straight away to, wow. the, to the leasing companies. So those costs are not what we call in economics sunk. That is to say, the creditor companies can get the planes back, yep. start leasing the planes to mm. other people. One of them has been leased to a Greek airline. Those planes are now all ready to go. Right. Now, the Monarch's other assets, their very intangible assets, were their landing rights. Mm. Now, you'd think, what can you do with the landing rights? Well, it turns out that they thought originally that they could sell these landing rights. But mm. then there's been a great big legal battle mm. as to who actually owns the landing rights. Mm. Uh, and as I say, the landing rights consisted of an intangible asset. A landing right is not something you can touch or feel. Yep. So it's a very intangible thing. Yep. And that was an important intangible asset for the company because they owned essentially the early, early morning slots at very congested airports. Right. And in the modern era of low cost airline business models, that turns out to be very valuable. Now, is it the airport that gives the landing rights? Well, this is the subject, I mean, of a long legal battle. Mm. It it was never clear who owned the landing rights, or, Until, more, yeah. or more interestingly, everybody thought before Monarch went, went bust that Monarch owned the landing rights. Yep. It then wasn't clear whether it was the airport who owned the landing rights, or whether it was the company, there's a company who essentially coordinates uh, airport slots in the UK. It wasn't clear whether that company uh, owned the landing rights and it mm. remitted back to them. Anyway, to go back to the definition of sunkenness, yep. 
Uh, it was actually resolved last week in the Court of Appeal that Monarch actually do own the landing rights. But mm. there was quite a long period of time where it looked like those intangible assets were not something which Monarch's creditors could recover. Right. And that's what a sunk cost is. A sunk mm. cost is a cost is once you've incurred it, that is to say, once you've got these landing rights, you simply can't get it back again. Yeah, well, I was, I was thinking if, if, for example, this podcast was, say, a private endeavour and it was a business, so to speak, if I would have paid somebody to build the website that, and for, for some reason I want to sell the podcast, I can't sell the website. It's not physical. Whereas if I bought microphones... I could sell microphones again. That's, that's sort of just exactly right. If you'd spent a load of money advertising this podcast, yeah. for example, and it's then gone. you go and sell the sell the business, yeah. you can't go back to the advertisers and say, well, please can I have my money back? Right. Whereas if you bought a whole load of microphones, okay. uh, you can go back to the microphone people and say, well, can I sell you these microphones back? Yeah. Uh, and so the tangible assets are much less likely to be sunk. The intangible assets are much more likely to be sunk. And obviously the alarming thing you'd think is that uh, we're moving into an intangible world. So with, with so many sunk costs out there, it's, uh, I, guess a, I guess, a point of discussion we will get to. But spillovers, a firm making an intangible investment will not receive all or perhaps any of the returns. This is a very important aspect yeah. of, of, of intangibles. And it essentially goes like this. If I build a big factory, for example, Nobody else can get the advantage of that factory. Other people can't come and set up their machines inside the factory. I can lock the doors. Mm. You know, private property is respected. That's the end of it. Suppose, on the other hand, I invent the iPhone. Now, if you think about what smartphones looked like before the iPhone, yeah. they looked all sorts of weird shapes and sizes, mm. and they had funny keyboards on yep. them, and you God could move, you and could, God, you could flip move them, phones, you could slide flip, phones, exactly, flip them up, and you know, within about eighteen months of the invention of the iPhone, basically every single smartphone just looked like an iPhone with yep. the same blank shape, uh, with the same blank screen, and the same kind of look at it. So there's an example of a spillover, which is mm. that the inventors of the iPhone, uh, who had this intangible asset called design. They design this particular looking shape uh, mm. and every single other company then went out and essentially copied it. Mm. That's unlike the example where you've got a factory. Other companies can't come into your factory. But once you produce a design, everybody can copy something which looks like it. So one of the features of intangible investments is that other people can probably copy it as well. Mm. Subject, of course, to intellectual property rights and all that kind of thing. So some R&D is patented and all of that. But essentially, knowledge can be reused mm. in other contexts. And um, this is why it might make it difficult for firms to recover all the investment that they've made if other firms essentially pick up on what they're doing. And do you think we will see a rise of how these uh, these spillovers can be protected moving forward? Yeah, so it's going to be really, really important mm. for businesses and for the people who work for businesses. And if you're thinking about your future careers prospects, protecting and bringing together those intangible assets and making sure that only you and your company can exploit them mm. is going to be very important in the well, future. I think a perfect example of spillovers, again, just to, just to continue from the iPhone example, almost on a weekly basis you see uh, the news about Samsung and Apple in, in a patent war. And it's very little things like the, the size of the icon of their apps and their applications. You know, the, the hundreds of millions of dollars worth of lawsuits just for really tiny details. And it really is a manifestation of the spillover concept. Amazon have been trying to patent their one-click ordering for a number of years. A one-click ordering is, as you know, you just click once uh, yeah. on the panel and then, yeah. the, and then the thing comes to you. Uh, trying to get a patent out of that mm. is, as you say, uh, if you want to try to stop these spillovers to other firms, uh, then that's the kind of way that you're going to start directing your efforts. Very difficult indeed. So finally, the, the last S, synergies. Intangible assets are often especially valuable when combined with other intangibles and human capital. So their value is a lot larger when it's combined with other intangibles. We think this is an important property of intangibles. And one way to think about this is possibly the best known example of an intangible asset, although people don't call, call it that, uh, which every single person knows is one of the great British innovations, and yeah. it is, of course, Harry Potter. Okay. So if you think about the script 
of Harry Potter. Mm. I mean, the script is a sort of tangible asset, the piece of paper upon yeah. which it's written. Mm. But of course, it can be reproduced over and over again. So right. it's an intangible asset, um, uh, uh, really, because it's the sort of thought and the words and the and the notion of Harry Potter. Yeah, that's very valuable. And good luck to J.K. Rowling, who's obviously done very well out of it. Yep. Once you start putting that together with some other assets, then you can really start motoring. So if you think about what the Harry Potter industry is, mm. it's the fantastic script. It's the computer generated software. It's the amazing set design. Yep. It's the fantastic marketing. Mm. Uh, and then it's the ability, of course, to distribute it very widely over the Internet. In other words, it's the Harry Potter enterprise is itself a whole bundle of intangible assets. The software is an intangible asset. The set design is an intangible asset. The reputation that Harry Potter got is an intangible asset. Once you bundle all of those things together, mm. then you can have something like uh, which is as successful as the Harry Potter franchise. So that's why we call it synergies. Okay. That is to say, the thing about Harry Potter uh, the thing about intangible assets is that their value in combination yep. is extremely large. And then you mentioned, uh, I, I mean, that, that also that they're, they have synergies with talented individuals. The talented individuals are, of course, the actors yep. uh, or the script writers or people like that yeah. uh, who are part of all of this. So uh, actually, when I was going through uh, the book and page 177, the chapter uh, where you're talking about the venture capitalists, there is a section which I like, which I think emphasizes the point of synergies goes like this, so you're saying the social connections and reputation that the best VC firms enjoy help them not only to build networks to exploit synergies, but also to increase the value of contested assets. So they're exploiting the synergies, and, and I think one of, one of what you've mentioned there as well is one of the reason why these venture capitalists do so well, why their funds perform phenomenally, is because they plug into the other companies they have on their portfolio, or the networks or their contacts and they bundle all that together. Yeah, so this is one of the consequences of all these different properties that we talk about la la later on in the in the book and we, yeah. we think it's a it's it's a fairly important one. I mean, think about a tangible company and think about if you are a bank uh, backing a tangible company. It's not that complicated, really. Mm. You say to the company, you own a whole bunch of assets, you own yep. some trucks, you own some buildings, we'll lend you some money against the trucks and the buildings, and then you, the bank, you just go and, well, you play golf, basically. <laughs> they get on with it, and you are secure in the knowledge uh, that if it uh, doesn't work out, hopefully it will, but yep. if, it, if it, by some misfortune, doesn't work out, you can get your hands on the buildings, you can get your hands on the trucks. In the case of Monarch Airlines, you can get your hands on, on the aircraft. Whereas if you're trying to back an intangible company, as we were saying before, it's probably going to be really, really hard to get your money back. You can't mm. get your money back on the marketing. You can't get your money back on the social connections and all that kind of thing. Mm. So we think that the financial system, and in particular venture capital, is going to evolve in a very, very different way in order to accommodate uh, the, a, a different form of financing uh, that's required to back these intangible companies. Okay, now do we have any speculation as to how that future financing would look like or would you say it's still sort of under progress? Is it still I, I think it is under progress yeah. because at the moment the financial model that we have in our mind when we think about financial institutions is very much tangible intensive. Like I say, uh, lend against the planes or lend against mm. the buildings or lend against the machinery and then the bank can just go home and, uh, you know, go, go to sleep for a year yeah. and, and see what happens the following time. Whereas, yeah. whereas if you're going to lend against intangible assets, you need a very different type of structure. So if you're going to lend against the intangible assets, you need a very different type of structure. And, and here's the way we think about it. Uh, those of you uh, who've been to a nightclub will know okay. that uh, everybody really wants to dance with everybody else, okay. but it's pretty embarrassing to go onto the dance floor first, right? right? Um, it's just a fact of life, unfortunately. <laughs> there's, there's just pretty embarrassing. So right. what you really want is you want the best looking, most confident person to go on the dance floor first. Okay. And then everybody comes and everybody has a great time. Right. So this is the way to think about financing. Okay. When you've got this very uncertain financing, uh, with intangible investment, it's like a dance floor problem. Mm. Everybody really wants to finance it, but everybody's very uncertain about how it's going to work mm. out. You may not be able to get the money back. Yeah. So what do you want? You want the first person to go on mm. the dance floor. Well, the first person to go on the dance floor in Silicon Valley is going to be one of the big key venture capitalist investors. If they're the ones who put the money in, that essentially crowds in 
all the money from the other types of investors as well. Right. So the social connections that the Silicon Valley investors have, their ability and their experience in previous in, intangible types of investments, all of that is going to make it much more likely that they can go first, if you see what I mean. Mm. Once they go first, everybody then follows right. them. They're confident that there will be a domino effect. Correct. Which will be in their favour. Correct. And, th and that's one effect. And then the other effect, again, which goes back to this property of uh, sunkenness mm. of intangible investments, is if you're not going to be able to get your money back... One way of uh, an investor trying to do, trying to navigate their way through that is to break uh, a business uh, endeavor into a series of little projects mm. and fund it for a while, see how it's going, mm. fund it for a bit longer, see how it's going. And if the uncertainty, and that is a way of trying to resolve the uncertainty yep. uh, that's going to be in these uh, business uh, endeavors where you can't get your money back. What you want is you want lots of stages. And at every mm. stage, you're going to learn about the project, learn about how it's going, how many people have signed up for it, whether the network is growing, whether the software works or not, whether the design is doing the right thing. Yep. Uh, split the project up into lots of different bits. Yeah. So the way to think about venture capital mm. in Silicon Valley is you've got this initial dance hall problem we talked about earlier okay. on. Uh, and then after that, you split it up into lots of different bits and you see what the stages of financing are. Mm. And you can are. quantify that. Yeah. And you can quantify that. Yeah. But again, it goes back to it's not a sort of a mysterious evolution with, you know, no economic benefit, no economic basis whatsoever. Mm. It goes back to this whole issue about sunkenness. Uh, and it's a rational response by investors okay. who, what, who know that with these intangible intensive products, it's going to be potentially very hard to get your money back. Now, in the book, in the same chapter as well, you mentioned how this model cannot be implemented elsewhere. Why? Countries have tried throughout the world to, to look a bit like Silicon Valley. So they've given banks a whole lot of money. Government institutions have set themselves mm. up. They've tried to set up neighborhoods where they'll look a bit, or, uh, look, uh, look a bit like this. <laughs> okay. um, and that's fine, but it just never really seems to have worked. It's maybe worked in Tel Aviv uh, and it's yeah. worked in Silicon Valley, but it just didn't, didn't seem to have worked elsewhere. Okay. And many, many governments are sort of scratching their heads about this. So they start, I don't know, throwing more money at the problem, for example, because there isn't enough money or <laughs> getting some more big personalities because there aren't enough big yeah. personalities or anything like that. Yeah. Still doesn't work. Again, I think what we try to talk about in the book is the way to understand it is because these assets are predominantly intangible assets mm. and because they require this delicate set of uh, uncertainty resolution mechanisms, the who's going to go on the dance floor first types of problems, yep. they are quite locally based or their success is quite locally based. So you're going to need, it's not mm. only the provision of the money, but it's the, it's the knowledge of these very uncertain assets. And that seems to be very exclusive to Silicon Valley and to Tel Aviv, where you've got a series of experienced investors who know what uh, these kind of projects look like. Okay. Uh, and again, unless those experienced investors go first, nobody else is going to come onto the dance yeah. floor as well. Yeah. So if you don't have those experienced and knowledgeable investors, then the whole system is going to break down. And I think that's why it's proved to be very difficult, difficult. to set it up outside of okay. those neighbourhoods. Just to go back briefly to the financing part. Um, now, one of the questions I had initially was, uh, what will lenders start using as collateral, given that there's even like companies of the future have less tangibles. Would it be a huge consideration as to who they're funding? Would that put a bigger emphasis on the person behind the business, their qualification, their experience? Because they they can't, you know, they don't have assets. There are two ways this could go. One way is to say, if there's really no market in these intangible assets, like there's a second-hand market in buildings, there's a second-hand market in, in, in plant machinery and vehicles. If there's no second-hand market, then it's going to have to be a lot of look and feel. It's mm. going to have to be personal connections. It's Gray going area, to have to be the, right? the personality. Yeah. On the other hand, if a market evolves in, the, in these intangible assets, then we can start trading all of this stuff. Once we start trading all this stuff, then it could potentially be security. And it wouldn't matter who owned it. Mm. You would know that there would be a market upon which you could then go and sell it. So again, in the case of the planes, nobody cares who owns the planes mm. but there's a well-developed second-hand market for monarchs planes so mm. it can go off and be sold and the interesting thing is that markets for intangible investments are evolving very slowly but they are evolving in certain ways so for example uh, you can secure money now against your software so British Airways, oh. uh, who've got uh, some pretty complicated software, if you've ever booked your ticket on British Airways, mm -hmm. 
you'll know it runs 24 hours a day. People mm. are booking in hundreds of different currencies. It's got to make sure it doesn't double book you. I mean, this is pretty impressive software mm. that does all of this. Mm. Uh, British Airways have managed to secure some money and borrow against the value of that software. And a little market has started to evolve mm. in this intangible asset of software. So if markets start going, uh, then that might ease these financial problems and essentially make them more anonymous in the way that they are for yeah. tangible assets. It's, it's, it's so interesting to start to think about how who is the person that would have valued the software. You know, would it have been from British Airways themselves? Would they have brought an independent to value it? And is it an accurate valuation? Well, one of the things uh, about that the banks do know about software for airlines is that if the uh, airlines stop paying they, the banks, can then just go and grab the software Ooh. if uh, uh, if that's the way the market works. Right, okay. And can you imagine how British Airways would operate without its software? Mm, it couldn't last okay. five minutes. In fact, it couldn't last one minute because right, right, nobody right, would, right. Be a, would be able to make any bookings. Okay, so okay, it right. is actually an asset that they can uh, credibly pledge yep. to other parties who would lend This is actually it. an excellent example, I'd say, because the, the it's, it's almost the, the, the modern-day tangible asset, which Correct. traditionally or historically the bank would have taken your building Correct. And, or factory. Now I don't have a business anymore if I don't have my factory. Exactly. Equally for British Airways, I don't have my software, I can't run my business. So, oh. Exactly right. So let's let's go to the final part, which is the consequences. What are the consequences of the intangible economy? And um, you've summarised it into how many how many consequences? Uh, I think we've got about six consequences actually. Okay. Um, maybe the kind of biggest consequences are kind yeah. of a winners and losers uh, okay. uh, situations. So maybe we could sort of talk about that. Yeah. yeah. Uh, one of the features of the economy which a lot of economists have looked at, mm. is a big gap between the winners and the losers in, mm. the eco in the economy. Now, this manifests itself in various different ways. One way it manifests itself in is amongst firms. So there have been, there has, seems to have been over the last decade an emergence of particularly large firms in a way that we haven't really seen before. Okay. So Google, the Microsoft, Google, the Microsoft yeah. people like Huge. that. I mean, half a trillion Market cap, 400 correct. billion, 500 billion. We've never seen. Co correct. Uh, and relative to the laggards, yeah. these firms are just pulling a very, very long way ahead. Mm. Uh, and that is not only in the IT world. It seems to be in other worlds as well. Uh, uh, so that's one dimension of the winners and the losers. Okay. The other dimension of the winners and losers is, of course, the wages that people are paid. Mm. Uh, if you're working at Google, if you're not working at Google, those are very different types of compensation packages which you're going to get. So that's a kind of another uh, winners and losers kind of dimension. Okay. And the other winners and losers dimension is between the cities and the and and not not in the cities and the rural areas. Mm. There appears to be a widening gap, mm. and we think all of this has got something to do with the change towards the intangible world. Wow! So there's a link between the difference or inequality between people living in rural areas and people living in cities, and you can attribute that to the intangible economy. Yep. So if we go back to the properties of the intangible economy, so let's take cities as yeah. uh, as your question. If we go back to the properties of the intangible economy. Mm. A couple of the properties we mentioned were spillovers and synergies. So the spillovers are, if you remember, that if I invent the look of an iPhone, you can uh, have the similar look of an iPhone. Yep. The synergies are, if I have a fantastic mo movie script and you've got terrific software which mm. goes with the movie and you and I get together, right. you know, we can do very well. Well, where do those spillovers and synergies mm. occur? Okay. With all due respect to lovely villages and all mm. of that, they're <laughs> not going to occur in the great British countryside. Right, they're yeah. much more likely to occur in the big urban agglomerations okay. where people bump into each other, where you have these types of relationships, where it's kind of, as it were, in the air. Yeah. So what economists are interested in uh, is how these what are called agglomeration externalities, that is that is to say how these effects of people meet, getting together with each other, mm. they are uh, very important in the intangible world uh, for the reasons I said. So again, take the Harry Potter idea. You know, the Harry Potter is the fusion of the script mm. plus the software plus the actors plus the set design. Mm. Uh, that's not going to take place in, in, in some rural village or other. That's, yeah. gonna, that's probably going to take place in a city. Uh, so the winners and the losers are going to be the cities where all of these types of uh, spillovers and synergies are going to be occurring okay. relative to the countryside. And you've also mentioned partly in the consequences part chapter 11 page 240 which is that just to jump straight to the last two lines mm -hmm. esteem inequality rises as psychological traits like openness to experience become more important 
Can you tell us a little, little bit about that? This is a little bit more speculative, but what we have in mind is the following. If you ask yourself who's going to succeed, what's the type of person who's going to succeed in this intangible economy? Mm. Um, hopefully, if you've come this far on the podcast, you'll be thinking about your future <laughs> and wondering about the future of the economy. So hopefully this is going to be an important question. Uh, psychologists have got a series of personality traits mm -hmm. which uh, they think describe... Uh, a lot of the psycho psychological and personality uh, dimensions of people. So, for example, conscientiousness is one of their personality traits. Agreeableness is one of their personality traits. Mm. Tendency to be compassionate and cooperative. Openness to experience is one of the other personality traits. Uh, an appreciation for others, imagination, curiosity, and all that kind of thing. Okay. In this intangible world, if we're all these synergies going on, that is to say the intangibles are very valuable in uh, uh, in collection with each other, yep. uh, then what's the type of person who is going to be able to build those synergies? Well, that's probably going to be a kind, kind of person who scores high on the psychological traits of, for example, agreeableness or open to openness to experience. Uh, if you've got that, you're probably going to be the kind of person who is going to be able to create these synergies, bring these intangibles together, maybe manage mm. uh, uh, you know, di different types of people, maybe manage an organization uh, um, who's going to achieve these kind of advantages. Okay, so if all of that is going to be important, yeah. maybe what's happening is those types of people are increasingly moving to the cities where all this stuff is occurring. Okay. And the left behind mm. people are the people without those psychological traits. And that creates then an accentuated kind of cleavage mm. between the town and the country, mm. which previously was just on the basis of people moving back and forth, maybe without particularly these psychological traits, but yeah. maybe selecting much more on these psychological traits. And, and that's the kind of inequality that we talk about in the book, which we call the inequality of esteem. So often people outside cities feel that they're, like they're left behind, yeah. that they're not succeeding somehow or other. Uh, well, I, I say maybe they're just diff different kinds of uh, individuals. Fascinating, fascinating. So other consequences then? So far we've mentioned that the winner takes all. Yep, and, and one of the other dimensions of the winner takes all that, that comes from the scalability mm. is the emergence of these giant firms. So again, like the Googles and the LinkedIn and people like that, uh, every, many people say, oh, well, that's just a consequence of um, you know inadequate uh, uh, antitrust or inadequate uh, monopoly, mm. uh, 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 um, you know, monopoly policing and all yeah. that. We say no. Uh, we say that a lot of this is uh, these firms just scaling up enormously. Yep. So again, it just goes back to one of the fundamental properties of intangibles. And then it's not just winner takes all in terms of firms. It's also regions. I remember there's a section in your book, uh, if I'm not mistaken, that, uh, that I think mentions how many patents is awarded to regions in the United States. And unsurprisingly, New York and San Francisco are at the very top compared to other regions which are missing out. C uh, correct. So if you look at the share of US patents mm. across different cities, what you find is, not surprisingly, yeah. over the last 20, 30 years, the Bay Area has massively increased its share of patents. Mm. Uh, and you might say, well, that's not very surprising because the Bay Area is where the internet revolution is taking place, so they're all ICT patents. Mm. So if you draw a second graph and ask the question, what's the Bay Area's share in non-ICT patents? guess what? You find exactly the same thing. That is to say, the Bay Area right. has massively increased its share of non-ICD patents as well. So wow, we think okay. this is another Very consequence of the synergies between the intangibles, that once you get an area like the Bay Area, <clears throat> the cradle of the uh, internet revolution, uh, once it's got smart people going there, people with the various psychological tra traits, people who want to get together, they get together with other types of non-ICT uh, patent holders, uh, and then that way the economic activity is increasingly concentrated. The economic patenting activity is increasingly concentrated. So it's very infectious, essentially. It's, it, it actually infects other industries. It, it, it does, and it has all sorts of interesting consequences. So house prices, for example, in the Bay Area are absolutely very ins expensive. absolutely insane because yeah. everybody wants to move there. Yeah. Uh, for good reasons. For, for very yeah. good reasons. Uh, when I say everybody wants to move there, people who want to take advantage of the intangible assets uh, want to move there. And there's a very good reason why that's the case. But nonetheless, of course, uh, then if we want to get into the politics of this, 
those maybe are the areas who vote on one side and maybe the left mm. hand, maybe the more left behind areas are the various who areas who vote on the other side mm. and then you get uh, uh, you know lots of political division uh, in the way that we've seen uh, in recent elections so yet again we can link that to tangibles and intangibles well we think so as well from again yeah. the fundamental properties of the intangibles in this v- case very the interesting synergies. now a consequent leadership and management well uh, as i was saying before uh, if you think uh, that uh, an intangible economy is going to do well if there are lots of synergies in the mm. intangible economy, that is to say bringing these intangibles together. Mm. If you think that the intangible economy is going to do well uh, by having lots of talented people interacting with each yep. other, then um, the implications for leadership and management um, sort of follow fairly straightforwardly. So w- w- one thing uh, is that ec- high economic rewards obviously going to go to the talented people mm. who are part of this network of intangibles, the talented actors, the talented scriptwriters, the the, the, the the talented software designers. But then the other set of economic uh, good economic rewards are going to go to the people who can coordinate all of this activity. Right. And if you think about what, for example, multinational firms do mm. is they are amazing coordinators of activity, disparate supply chains, uh, uh, often thousands and thousands of miles long. Uh, this is the thing that multinationals are very good at. So as an example, uh, when you take Apple, yeah. when Steve Jobs uh, passed away yeah. and Tim Cook was appointed the chief executive of, of Apple, yeah. many people thought, wait, is he, a, is he the design guy or is he the mm. software guy or is he the, you know, the things okay. that you would equ- equate with Apple? No, not at all. He was the operations manager of Apple. That is to say, he was the one who set up the amazing Apple supply chain and all of its relationships within Apple right. that allow it, essentially, that when it launches, you know, in Oxford Street, it's got, you know, 100,000 of its phones already, yeah. uh, already for the launch. So it, it is the coordination and the management uh, behind that multinational enterprise, which was rewarded very strongly. And again, it's the management of those intangible assets we think is going to be very important. Okay, so on this point, one of the questions I wanted to ask you here was, what could future graduates or to-be graduates or people thinking about what they should study at university, is how can they prepare themselves for an intangible economy? And I thought that maybe the discussion where you'd point to maybe computer science or something technical... Um, or maybe even if you were to be a little bit biased to say <laughs> economy. Yeah. But you're saying that actually it's better to think uh, in the bigger picture. How can you become a person that can coordinate activity? I, I think that's exactly right. How I mean, can you learn that? Well, uh, uh, let me step back just for a second. Yeah, I, sure. I, I, I should say that since I'm a economics university lecturer sure. uh, at Imperial, and since I absolutely love economics, sure. uh, as, as uh, any students listening to me uh, will have heard me sort of be evangelize about economics okay. all the time, naturally my advice is you've got to go off and study economics. But okay. le- uh, but I, I'm obviously very self-interested uh, in all of that. Come to Imperial as well, uh, where it's all taught very well and you'll have a great 100%. time and all that kind of thing, o- o- obviously. Um, <laughs> but leaving that small self-interested bit of marketing um, behind, yeah. I think a couple of things. One is is you should do what you really want to do, of course, because one of the things that the intangible economy will do is it'll reward talent Mm. in a way that maybe talent hasn't been rewarded before. So if you think about musicians, for example, uh, I know it's really difficult to make it as a musician, Mm. but the possibility of musicians getting themselves noticed via the internet, the scaling up Mm. that they can potentially do, uh, has just become much, much easier. Uh, So I think one should try, try to make the most of one's talent. Uh, and of course, if you've got the talent to be a musician and an actor and all of that, and you can get into the Harry Potter supply chain, right. you can do very well as right, well. Okay. So that's one set of activities. The other set of activities, as you describe, is those kind of coordinating and management activities, mm. which of course can be very difficult. Uh, often when you're trying to get creative people together and you're trying to organize them in a, in a way, that can be quite hard. Yeah. You know, they might be very uncooperative and all that sort of thing. Uh, and so there might be very big rewards to doing all of that. And as I mentioned earlier on, uh, man- Managing, you know, international supply chains. Mm. I mean, that's pretty complicated too. Yeah. Uh, so doing all that sort of stuff, uh, I think, will achieve great rewards. Now, if you ask the question, how can you sort of teach all of that? Mm. Uh, I don't think necessarily the answer is to become a whizzo computer scientist, actually. Mm. I mean, hats off to computer scientists. Yeah. And, and a really good computer scientist 
uh, is obviously going to succeed. But the people who are good at the coordination and good at the management and all of that, they probably come for all sorts of different sides. They might be science mm. graduates, they might be arts graduates, they might be uh, something very different. It's a different way, I think, about thinking about uh, the skills and talents that people have got wow. to just requiring them to be really good at coding in Python or yeah. something. Yet another consequence. So to, to go back to the managing part, there's mm. uh, on, in page 188, chapter 9, um, I actually found this slightly fascinating as well, which was, so I'm just uh, reading here, as we discussed in chapter 6, if people tend to relate the success of a company to its hero manager rather than to general progress of technology or the state of the economy or the organizational capital embodied in the company itself, they may reward the manager too highly. Can you comment on that? Well, one of the I important features of the economy over the last sort of 20 years is that CEO pay has absolutely skyrocketed. And this is, of course, terribly, terribly controversial. Mm. And lots of people allege that these CEOs are milking companies with money and it's all unfair and all that kind of mm. thing. And um, you, you might put that, and this is the point of the quote, you might put that down to a fundamental attribution area, which is kind of a cognitive bias, okay. which says, be they sports people, be they actors, be they managers, people have just got this weird psychological trait of liking heroes somehow. Yep. And they put the success of, in this case, a company, possibly it might be a sports team or possibly it might be a movie, they ascribe all of its success yeah. to the hero manager or, you know, the big guy or gal at the very top. Yep. And this is just a horrible cognitive uh, error. And therefore, the payments of these managers is entirely unjustified because people have just made this terrible, terrible kind of psychological mistake. That's one sort of set of arguments. Okay. We say there might be something in that, but let's just bear in mind that what these managers are doing in an intangible intensive world is they're doing all the coordination and they're doing these organization type of activities that we mentioned earlier on, mm. which because of the power of synergies and because of the power of spillovers might be very, very valuable. So yeah. at least part of what they're doing, actually the manager might be worth, it might be worthy of their hire. Yeah, yeah. I think th there's many perspectives how you can look at this uh, because I, I read on Quora recently I don't know if you know this uh, it's a Q&A website very interesting mm. um, and they were commenting on Satya Nadella who's the CEO of Microsoft the newly appointed CEO of Microsoft now if you compare the market cap of Microsoft which is 636 billion compared to what he gets compensated on a yearly basis which I think is roughly 200 million dollars it's actually a it's very very small percentage of the overall company but as you say what he actually does is difficult extremely difficult. How can you coordinate a company with this scale that's all over the world? Uh, and and as we were saying earlier on, Apple indeed rewarded the person who did that coordination right. with, with the top job. Yeah. So I think that's an indication about how valuable this all is. And uh, just to get another section in there, I, I, I love how occasionally you get philosophical in capitalism like capital. There's uh, page 188 again and uh, sort of 60% uh, through the page. He argues that fascination with others who are loved is part of our natural desire to be loved ourselves. So, like, loving Elon Musk or loving Steve Jobs is... There's a reason because we want to be loved as well. We wanted to have a little bit of academic distinction in this book. Okay. So how can you have academic distinction? You've got to quote the greatest philosopher of them all, which is Adam Smith, okay. uh, his theory of moral sentiments. Right. And basically Adam Smith in, in that book struggles with this terrible issue about what causes humans to you know, behave reasonably. Mm. Uh, and uh, the, it's the desire to be loved. Mm. Uh, is what Adam Smith yeah. talks about is the reason you behave reasonably he says it's kind of as if someone were watching over you mm. uh, and, uh, and 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 looking at your looking at your behavior and a manifestation of that uh, is that people are obsessed uh, pe pe people's desire to be loved manifests itself uh, in kind of loving heroes and loving celebrities and all that kind of thing. Right. And that appar apparently was very big in the 18th century, uh, just as it as mm. it, uh, just as it is big now. Yeah, yeah. And um, just before we move on to public policy, which we need to shed some light on, um, you commented on Peter Thiel's book Zero to One, mm. um, and this is the part when uh, uh, just to quote again, it's page 187. Um, the emphasis of network effects is an insight of fields that suggests that governments might become more important to company success in the future. I guess that's uh, not so bad of a cue to public policy. Um, so what did you mean by that? Uh, 
the context in which we were discussing that was uh, about Elon Musk. Mm. Uh, Elon Musk uh, co-founded PayPal uh, mm. with, with Peter Thiel. Mm. And um, what is Musk doing? Musk is one of these kind of hero entrepreneurs Absolutely. who one interpretation of what he's doing is it's a very intangible based business at which he's just trying to bring together in some massive form of coordination so if yeah. you think about electric cars what do electric cars need they need an extraordinary assemblage of items to make them successful it's not only the technology of the car it's the technology of the software very intangible mm. it's the technology of the battery the battery is tangible but the technology around it obviously is intangible yep. then of course you need an extraordinary infrastructure you need charging points in the cars you know in the same way that when we first started with uh, petrol cars mm. there weren't any petrol stations when we first started mm, so if okay. you think about it the early history of petrol cars I mean, if you were the first car driver and there were no petrol stations around, why would you ever get started? Yeah. So these things need a lot of coordination. Mm. Uh, now, one way uh, uh, of doing that coordination is to have extraordinary, you know, entrepreneurs like uh, Elon Musk mm. who are going to apparently build a whole network of charging stations. Mm. The other way to do it is to have governments do, do the coordination right. because that's what governments are kind of there for. They're responsible for kind of coordinating these public goods. Yep. And so the, that's a kind of the lead in to our discussion about policy, yep. which is that if increasingly there are these goods which require these coordination, require these uh, uh, factors to be uh, assembled together, yeah. maybe that might be an increased role for government. And to, just to add to that on the book, again, the same page, um, you said, and Musk has been as much an entrepreneur in getting the support of governments as he has been in driving the technology in the business, which again explains that he, he isn't a one-trick pony. He really needs to do everything. Uh, he absolutely does. So it's not just you know, it, writing some fantastic software. Yeah. It's getting the government to subsidize electric vehicles, getting the safe, the safety uh, type of legislation involved so yeah. that uh, these things can be amplified and so on. And that just links back to the to the future coordinators or, or how, how a young person today could essentially prepare themselves for a future. And that is one where you say, don't isolate yourself to a narrow field. You're going to need a whole set of skills. Uh, correct. And as we were saying before, some of those skills might be programming in Python. Yep. Yep. Other of those skills might be much what are called softer skills, right. like agreeableness, like the ability to get along yep. and the ability to bring people around uh, with you. Uh, and all of that in, in business schools, at least, if I can just, uh, yeah. just talk about business schools for a second, Sorry. all of that is often grouped around the general heading of leadership. Mm. So... Uh, uh, there are various definitions of leadership, but one way of thinking about why people are so interested and obsessive with leadership is that they've kind of grasped the essential intangible point, mm. which is that leadership and the coordination is going to be required to bring together these intangible assets. Well, I, 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 can, I can tell you if I was to uh, m mention my own experience, so I did electrical engineering for my undergraduate degree, mm. and now I'm at the business school studying management, right. deliberately for this reason. I believe in the, being able to combine the technical with the ability to actually implement it elsewhere. But we, let's shed some lights on the challenges to public policy as a consequence, because I feel like that, that's one that maybe we haven't uh, emphasized enough. And he's saying science policy, but extend innovation policy, cities, immigration, infrastructure. This is something of tremendous interest to Imperial, obviously, mm. which is a sort of predominantly science and technology college. Uh, uh, let's just go back to the spillovers example. So again, the spillovers example, somebody in Imperial discovers something, they publish it in an academic journal, everybody can then read about it. That knowledge is essentially spilled over to anybody else, uh, you know, who, who wants to have some knowledge of it. Which is great in this case. Yeah. Which which, okay. which which is great. Okay. Uh, if, if you wanted a concrete example, yeah. uh, the stealth bomber, uh, mm. in back in the 1970s yep. the original engineers at Lockheed were mm. working not on a bomber with a particular shape that was invisible to radar but a bomber that could fly very fast basically mm. with on very high and they thought that that would avoid radar uh, the Russians they had a load of scientists who were also working on the stealth bomber, but they were working on the bomber with a particular shape and the particular, um, a particular kind of paint on the outside of it. Okay. The Russian generals decided that this was a total waste of time. So the Russian scientists said, as scientists would do, well, OK, but please could we write up our results and publish them in an academic journal? Okay. The generals couldn't care less about an academic journal. They probably never, they didn't even know what an academic journal was. <laughs> but sure enough, the scientists wrote it up. 
probably set it for homework for yep. their uh, for their poor students. Yep. It was published in a Russian academic journal. It was translated immediately into English. And the Lockheed engineers read this and immediately stopped what they were doing and instead completely redesigned the, self, the stealth bomber to have the particular shape and use the particular structure on the outside, which is invisible to radar. So wow. there's, there's an example of spillovers. Okay. That is to say, there's an example where these scientists publish something in an academic journal. It's spilled over elsewhere. Okay. That's what Imperial College and other colleges obviously are doing. Now, no individual company is going to support that because yep. no individual company would spend all the money to design a stealth bomber and then have some other country, you know, then yeah. end, up, end up with the design. Yeah. So we are, we normally in, in, in Western societies, we ask the government uh, to uh, to spend on that money because we think it's got some general social good. So all of that is basically a way of saying that one of the challenges in the intangible economy mm. is what is the government going to do in terms of its support for science? If increasingly there are going to be all of these uh, knowledge activities which the private sector is going to carry out, then those are going to be helped greatly by having a strong science base upon which to build those activities. So if Sainsbury's, for example, has got a whole lot of data about you yep. and there are some fantastic algorithms out there yep. which computer scientists at various universities and whatever are busy developing, then it's going to really help Sainsbury's to have those algorithms being freely available. Right. So the question is what's the role of the government uh, in providing that kind of support for intangible based innovation okay. uh, in the, in the in the form of basic science that's a big policy challenge yeah well the the, the most recent one out now in the past week alone is the net neutrality uh, discussion and that is one where governments need to step in and actually kind of determine whether you can segment the internet because what 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 ISPs are doing internet service providers some of them i think an example is in portugal i believe is where they are splitting or segmenting the internet you receive at home to specific websites. So, for example, a subscription to um, Netflix and Facebook and Google would cost you, say, 10 euros a month. But if you wanted to also visit a website like Hulu or Quora, that's an extra 6.99 euros a month. So there was, But then now governments are stepping in saying, no, no, you cannot do this. Net, the net needs to be completely neutral. If you're going to allow people to consume the internet, they should be able to access it all and with no lags in speed whatsoever. So... I mean, am I correct in assuming that this is an example of where governments are interfering? So that's an excellent example of where you need government uh, to basically set the framework yeah. behind this intangible economy. Yeah. I mean, the, the other thing, of course, that this gets you into is whether the capacity of the Internet mm. uh, might be exceeded. Maybe what we need to be doing is building a whole load more broadband, a whole load more Internet capacity. Mm. Um, because maybe what this is symbolic of is the fact that we're just running out of capacity on the Internet. Okay, Professor, it's been a very, very fascinating conversation with you. And uh, I would like to possibly end it with uh, the following question, just as a summary. Why should people care about the intangible economy? Because the change to intangibles has got very different consequences, even though the nature of the economy has been changing over these years. The change in intangibles is just it has a different set of consequences to before. So going back to what we were saying before, things like the synergies of intangibles mean that there are tremendous opportunities for talented people, but mm. there are also great opportunities for people who can coordinate those talents and bring those synergies together. That's a different set, I think, of opportunities to the kind of opportunities we've had in the uh, economy before. Fascinating. So how can people get hold of the book? The book is available on Amazon, uh, so please uh, download it on Amazon. Uh, and then we've had some various launch events, including one at Imperial mm -hmm. on the 28th. Uh, and there's videos uh, that can be uh, watched by, by all of that. So if you just search for Capitalism Without Capital, mm -hmm. uh, it'll, it'll all come up uh, on Google for you. Brilliant. And there will be a link directly to the uh, Amazon uh, page for Capitalism Without Capital by Professor Jonathan Haskell and Stian Westlake. Professor, it's been an honour and a pleasure having you here. Thanks very much. Thank you. Bye-bye.